can be a little bit of a hodgepodge. Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. Today is a continuation of the life support segment of the ICU basic series. We're going to talk about a couple different types of life support today. I didn't think there was enough to make individual videos about all of them. So I put them all together in this video. So it's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge. I post videos every Tuesday. And Friday, my Tuesday videos are typically more like this, educational and topical relating to the intensive care unit. Friday, I do more laid back and fun videos. If you're interested in any of that, don't forget to subscribe. As I said in the past videos about life support, life support is just supporting somebody's life while we're able to deliver treatment for the underlying problem or give their body time to attempt to heal. In the situation where someone's blood pressure is very low, dangerously low that their heart may stop beating, we give medications called vasopressors. And these are medicines that act on the receptors that can squeeze the blood vessels, constrict the blood vessels to try to increase the blood pressure. So everything we do in medicine has risks and benefits. The benefits of this is it increases your blood pressure, so it's not at a dangerously low level. If your blood pressure is too low, your organs are not getting enough blood, enough oxygen, enough nutrients. So they're at risk of having damage or going into multi-organ failure. Some of the risks of these medicines is it can cause damage to the smaller blood vessels. For this reason, we place what we call a central line, typically in the neck, in the jugular vein, or in the groin in the femoral vein, just because these are bigger veins, so, so they're less likely to have damage from these medications. If we run these medicines through the smaller veins in the arm, they can constrict and it can affect blood flow down to the fingers and people's fingers who can turn black or need to be amputated. So that's a risk you run if you you know don't want a central line place but need one of these medications so usually those two things go together some of these med medicines also work on the receptors in the heart that cause it to squeeze harder or squeeze faster at times it can cause an elevated heart rate or abnormal heart rhythms to be on these medications we have five different vasopressors so if somebody is on maximum doses of all vasopressors and their blood pressure is still low, then we run out of options in terms of what we can do for them. There are situations where despite life support, somebody's body is so sick it continues to deteriorate. Many times I'll talk to families in this situation and tell them, you know, they're on the maximum doses of these medications and if their heart were to stop beating, the emergency doses of medicines that we give during that uh, cardiac arrest is what they're already getting. So the chance of them coming back from their heart stopping is very, very low, almost zero. When somebody's kidneys fail in the intensive care unit and if they are on these blood pressure medicines or blood pressures low, sometimes we need to do continuous dialysis. People who have end-stage renal disease outside the hospital, they'll go to a dialysis center three times a week for a half-day session and get dialysis. Somebody in the intensive care unit, if their blood pressure is low, they're not able to tolerate dialysis only for three to four hours because the, the machine pulls their blood out fast and tries to clear the blood quickly. And that can cause a lot of fluctuation in blood pressure and it could cause the blood pressure to drop. So in those situations, if somebody has low blood pressure and kidney failure, either new or old, we'll consider putting them on what we call continuous dialysis. And this is, you know, 24 seven dialysis. And again, we place a central line for this. It's a bigger one because it needs to be able to have good flows coming in and out, but it's the same exact procedure as the central line, either placed in the neck or the groin. There are times that I've seen people's kidneys completely recover so they no longer need dialysis after their hospital stay. But when the kidneys fail, there's always a risk that the damage is permanent, so people may be lifelong dialysis dependent. If the heart's having issues, there's also the option to have certain cardiac devices if a patient qualifies for them. There's a lot of um, you know, inclusion and exclusion criteria, and it's at the discretion of the cardiologist whether or not the patient is a good candidate for these. There is something called an intra-aortic balloon pump. It is a balloon that goes into the aorta which is the big blood vessel that leads from the heart and delivers blood throughout the rest of the body. This has a balloon that inflates and deflates and helps push the blood 
throughout the body in conjunction with the heart. There are also devices called left ventricular assist devices. There's also right ventricular assist devices that are a little less common, but if somebody's left ventricle fails and that is the chamber of the heart that pushes the blood out to the aorta to the rest of the body. So the blood goes from the left ventricle, the ventricle squeezes the blood out into the aorta to the rest of the body. So if this fails, then there's a device called an impella, which goes into the ventricle and helps circulate the blood out. And that's a type of left ventricular assist device or LVAD. And then there are more permanent LVADs that require surgery by a cardiothoracic surgeon and people will have this device in their left ventricle and they'll have a drive line that goes out to a little pump that the patients carry around with them. So in terms of the more permanent LVADs that people can have outside the hospital, there are, they're either a bridge to a transplant, this will be if a patient's waiting for an organ, they may require an LVAD, or if it's what we call a destination VAD, and that means they're not a candidate for transplant, so they'll remain on the VAD for the rest of their life. And this is supporting their life and their heart. So without the VAD, some people are 100% dependent on the VAD. So if anything happens to it, then they can die. If any of you guys watch season two of Grey's Anatomy, you'll remember that Izzy cut Denny, I think his name was, cut his drive line for his VAD. And she cut his wires for his VAD, hoping he'd get a heart transplant sooner, but he was dependent on the VAD, so he ended up dying. So don't mess around with someone's LVAD. Another type of life support device that we'll consider in the ICU is ECMO. And I'm going to go more in depth about that in my next video. A lot of people have had questions about ECMO since they've, saw, they've seen recently in the news, COVID patients have been requiring ECMO. So I'm going to make a dedicated video just to do a deeper dive into this device because it is complex and the inclusion exclusion criteria for it are rather strict. So I hope you enjoyed this brief video about different types of life support. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have any topics you'd like me to discuss, please leave them below. Like I said, if you are interested in hearing more about the intensive care unit, don't forget to subscribe. I'll be back on Friday with a reaction video and you can follow me on Instagram at the intense MD.